Hi everyone, in this second video of um, this topic I'm going to continue talking about chemistry prior to mid 1600s and then we're going to go into Robert Boyle and hopefully a little bit on Lavoisier. Okay, so if you look at the um, last video we ended here at Democritus who proposed the idea that being or really what we think about now as matter is composed of these indivisible pieces of stuff okay now he didn't know exactly what those are but he is you know remember that this is um, about 2500 years ago so it's a long time ago and there's no technology there's you know basically he just thought about this this is all a thought uh, experiment an idea or you can think of it now as a hypothesis of course in modern terms but it was just his idea that things are composed of um, stuff that is not divisible Okay, so smallest piece, and the Greek word for that is atomos. Now, Democritus had a colleague at the time, you know, another philosopher, ancient Greek philosopher, of course, Aristotle. And this is probably a name that you recognized. Uh, if you didn't recognize Democritus, you might have recognized Aristotle, because this is a common, uh, common philosopher that uh, a lot of times you would study in the beginning. Um, you know, liberal arts education, like in philosophy courses, sociology, or other courses as well, uh, history perhaps, and um, even in English you'll study some writings of uh, Aristotle, um, political science, and so on. So he's quite a, a you know, a famous uh, philosopher. He was very, and this is a picture of him with his uh, mentor, which is uh, Plato, and he uh, uh, was able to come up with a lot of different uh, ideas about different types of things like politics, you know, systems of governments and so on. But the other one of the things that he was able to come up with was this uh, uh, explanation for w why, you know, matter exists, right? So same idea, um, like, you know, uh, like Democritus, he was trying to figure out what is, you know, what is this uh, world composed of? What is all the th stuff around us is composed of? And Aristotle came uh, with a completely different idea, which is this idea of four essences. So he explained that everything that we see around us is some combination of these four factors here, or four essences, which is air, water, earth, and fire. And depending on how much of each of these four essences you have, the you know object will have a certain property, like wood, for example, may contain some amount of a lot of earth perhaps and maybe a little bit of you know air depending on what kind of wood it is and so on so that's kind of his idea of um, you know how what matter is composed of now now we know of course you know I'm gonna kinda of fast forward here to modern times we know that this idea is completely just wrong okay uh, but this actually is, is an interesting concept to discuss at this point which is the fact that this was an idea that took hold between about 300 uh, BC to about 1700 AD, so approximately 2,000 years. Okay, uh, people then operated using this idea of four essences uh, instead of the idea of this atomos. This was completely disregarded, and people didn't even think about it. And we just, um, you know, everybody operated through these 2,000 years using the idea of four essences, trying to explain things using that. And in fact, uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, we have these people called uh, alchemists, which is basically sort of like a, the chem chemists of, of the time, although it's a little bit questionable the, the ideas that they had, um, use Aristotle's theory to try to uh, transmute, which is change, uh, metals to gold, less, lesser metals in this case, things like iron, for example, or other, uh, you know, cheaper metals to gold, uh, to create something called the elixir, uh, elixir of life, which is basically the uh, potion that will get you to live forever, and other, um, uh, you know, things that really wouldn't be able to uh, exist. However, they were operating based on this idea of four essences. Okay. Uh, this is an important idea to to present at this point because uh, as you know there, there's to, to some extent in science you also have a little bit of politics so Aristotle was quite a bit you know was very well respected uh, you know a, a, a you know giant in, in in terms of philosopher so everybody kind of just took his idea and thought that that's probably the most reasonable idea around um, and Democritus, which is respected but not as, as uh, you know important figure as Aristotle, 
uh, ended up not being, you know, um, the, the, his ideas were not being applied as much as Aristotle, and as a result, we kind of went off, the, you know, went off track for 2,000 years before we realized that we're making a mistake here, okay? So, but it's something to kind of keep in mind that in science, you know, things like this, uh, human nature and whatnot still play a role. Okay, let's get back to chemistry now. So, in about, you know, 1776, and for those of you, you know, studying some amount of history before you probably realize this date is the date of the uh, American Revolution, uh, at that point, as you can see here now, our periodic table is... Uh, has a few more stuff that uh, didn't exist before 2400 years ago so these uh, additional colors here showing newer elements that were discovered uh, between these uh, period of about 2000 years and uh, once people know more about uh, these different uh, elements you know oxygen gases hydrogen gases and so on um, around this time in England Robert Boyle uh, who's a person who uh, started to do experiments, he realized that, you know, unless we m make quantitative observation, make measurements, in other words, right, things that we talked about in the previous chapter, once we start to, you know, unless we make measurements, we really can't um, advance um, our knowledge uh, with confidence. We have to be able to say that, okay, you know, I make this measurement several times, and as a result, I get these uh, results, which I can uh, confirm right with repeated experiments okay repeated measurements so he was the first one to kind of make this argument that you know we have to make these measurements in order for us to understand anything in order for us to have confidence in our uh, you know when we make these hypotheses so he actually wrote this book called the skeptical chemist uh, which is basically just skeptical chemists right um, and and he was questioning uh, a lot of the uh, thoughts and ideas that were presented up till that point he was saying that maybe all of these you know all these things that we thought were true is not true okay so he questioned the Aristotelian uh, idea uh, of the essences and he insisted that everybody should use this scientific method which is the idea of starting with a hypothesis do controlled experiment experiment where you actually measure things and then see the you know whether the experiment support or um, or uh, not support or fail to support your hypothesis okay and then so as a result you have to change your hypothesis so he often is called the first modern chemist and then of course we went on uh, after Boyle people then start to look at things a little bit different and think okay maybe it is important to um, you know make imp measurements right so there's there's a group of scientists who then uh, early scientists who then started to make careful measurements on uh, every time they make observations and so the first one is uh, Lavoisier uh, who uh, lived around 1789 and um, he proposed this law scientific law now which is the law of conservation of mass and the law of conservation of mass is fairly simply stated as the mass of um, things right reactants okay but we can call it just things you know mix, things that you mix together before uh, a particular chemical reaction particular change chemical change is the same as the mass of those uh, things after the reaction even though they might look different to you okay so a good example is shown right here these two things here right in these two containers uh, they don't look, um, they, you know, they look different here and then you mix them and then you get a chemical change because whatever you have here is no longer present in this thing. It looks very different, right? This is bright yellow. There's a lot of actually precipitate here. It's a little hard to see, but there's a lot of solid present here uh, in the original um, uh, stuff that you have here. Uh, both of them are clear and the color is not bright yellow, okay? So there's a big difference between this and that, but when you measure the masses of these two substances, they turn out to be exactly identical. And he repeated this experiment many, many times over. So that's what we call the law of conservation of mass. Now, this is an important law because once you think about the law of conservation of mass, you have to think about the fact that, well, so that means that there's something, the things that are in here originally stay exactly the same 
after that reaction, even though they look very different. And that's kind of an aha moment for most people, right? You look at these things, they look very different. You would think that, oh, something must have changed from here to here. But it turns out that there's something that also stays constant. And what's staying constant is the mass. The mass is staying constant. So that's the first time that people realize that, oh, you know, mass is a really important quantity, something that we need to look at because mass is not changing while the look of this thing changes a lot, right? So that's the first time when people start to realize that, oh, maybe we got to look at mass a little bit more, you know, dig in a little deeper into what makes up the mass of materials because it seems like that's a component that's not changing, okay? Now I want to mention a couple additional things about Lavoisier before we move on. Uh, Lavoisier is actually a very productive person. He had a lot of discovery in chemistry and, uh, um, you know, he, so he uh, claimed that he discovered oxygen and hydrogen, although they were actually discovered by a couple other people, but he was doing experiments with combustion. He was able to determine that water is composed of oxygen and hydrogen gases. Uh, before that people didn't know that. Uh, he was able to determine that air is composed of nitrogen and oxygen. Again, first person to determine that. He was able to disprove this idea of uh, something called phlogiston, which is basically what people consider the, the element or the essence that provided fire in, in matter. Um, and he shows that combustion is not because you have phlogiston, but it's because you have oxygen and you know you have something reacting with oxygen and rusting is the same as something reacting with oxygen okay um, so he also uh, come up with the basic uh, nomenclature system that you're gonna learn later on in this um, at the end of this chapter and come up with the metric system that we're now using for the uh, in scientific publications okay um, he was, you know, this is one of his experiments showing combustion using sunlight. You know, he's a magnifying glass here built up and then here's Lavoisier basically showing that combustion can happen in the presence of sunlight and oxygen. Uh, unfortunately, he was, again, we now went into a little bit of politics. He, he was on the wrong side of the uh, political uh, uh, system at the time and, and he was uh, executed. Uh, with the guillotine uh, as a result of his political beliefs but he was a very um, he was actually a very uh, uh, productive scientist you know discovered a lot of things okay